OK, well, first, thank you all for taking time for joining us today. I'm very excited to have you all here. See some uh, some folks that I know and some folks that are uh, hopefully new friends. So thanks for being here. I am James Segan, Pacific Northwest National Lab. And as you if, well, for people that are just joining, I think everyone's on mute, but try to stay on mute, please, um, until there'll be plenty of time for discussion. Um, let's see, so I'm presenting um, on behalf of, of the team that's listed here. Uh, this is a collaboration, um, well, with a, really a global collaboration uh, led by folks uh, out of Pacific Northwest, Northwest National Lab and Parallel Works, uh, funding from the USDOE uh, Office of Science, Environmental System Science, and the SBIR program. It's a collaboration between those two programs specifically. And so a few things. One is this is going this is already uh, rec being recorded, so we're going to post that on our on our YouTube channel for later viewing for folks that couldn't join. Let us know if you have any uh, challenges there. And uh, to give you a sense of what we're doing today, so we're going to go through and introduce uh, this research effort. It's this, uh, as it says in the top, this uh, Icon Modex research effort. I'm going to tell you what that means. We're going to go through what Icon is, what Modex is, um, how we're putting those together. We're then going to, that's sort of the method, high level method. And then we're going to tell you more about the science application of that approach um, as an upcoming uh, sampling and, and modeling effort. And then, so a real goal today is to um, sort of bi-directional. We really want to get feedback from you all in terms of this effort and how we can best use it to maximize mutual benefit. So there are research goals, of course, um, but we very much like to approach these kinds of efforts in a way with community feedback to help do things that are useful beyond our immediate research team, driving for, for mutual benefit. So, and that feedback can come in many different forms. Um, we'll be going through that today, but just to give you a sense of things, there'll be time for discussion today, of course. Uh, we can have follow-up meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings. We're going to have another community call that's going to get a little bit more into the weeds of the sampling, uh, likely in January. As I already said, the recording of this will be posted. You can email us right there, wonders at pnnl.gov. There, there's a feedback form. So that is a Google form. Um, that you can provide feedback uh, through. And there's a Google Doc there linked at the bottom. We're also, uh, we're going to use a polling system, uh, very interactive, should be pretty fun. Um, at, and we'll do that after the after the presentation. Um, so we get that link then. And I think Amy is going to be putting, um, it looks like she's already put links into the chat. I'm probably not going to be able to monitor the chat so well. Uh, but please feel free to put questions in the chat. Uh, raise your hand. We can certainly pause and clarify things as we go, and I'll rely on um, on Amy to alert me if someone has a question and has a hand raised or something like that. So with that, uh, we're going to launch in here. First, as I said, let's go through what is ICON, what is Modex. So ICON, first of all, is really a heuristic. It's a set of principles. Um, that we have been developing with others as well uh, as a way of doing science that is designed a priori and intentionally to maximize mutual benefit. So it's four principles uh, to make up the acronym. There's the I as is integrated, so intentionally and purposefully designing work that couples across disciplines, that couples physical, chemical, and biological processes and ideally across scales if possible, uh, so that we're not just doing, say, microbiology or we're not just doing hydrology, but we're trying to look at systems uh, more holistically. The C is for coordinated, where we are, again, intentionally uh, using consistent protocols, um, consistent methods, consistent approaches, and driving towards model relevant data um, so that uh, the efforts are enabling the development of transferable outcomes, both in terms of knowledge and data and models that are not just um, useful for only a single purpose or a single research group. The O of ICON is doing science openly, 
And um, I want to emphasize that this means doing science openly throughout the entire research life cycle. This is not just making data open at the end or just having a publication be open access. Those are certainly useful and very important unto themselves. But in, un, in an icon sense, it's being open throughout the whole research life cycle uh, from the ideas to the to the data, to the analyses, the publications as best as as best as possible. Of course, that includes providing open and fair data that's findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. That's a whole another set of principles that are very complementary uh, with with ICON. And those fair principles can be used as kind of a guiding light of how to how to be open throughout the research life cycle. And so right now this is this is this is ICON in action, like we're being open with our ideas and getting feedback. So that's part of this idea. And then the networked. The N of, of ICON is really doing the best that we can to intentionally design um, and implement research in a way uh, with the needs of a broad range of stakeholders in mind to help ensure mutual benefit. And that and that that networked principle kind of wraps everything together in a certain sense. And so again, this is network today is networked in action. We want to get your feedback. How can we make this effort helpful to you and to others? There's a number of links there, so I believe Amy put the link to this slide deck uh, in the chat. It's a Google slide deck. You can go open it. All those links should be live links. There's a, a workshop report. Um, that's the first place icon was was uh, coined. There's a couple of papers uh, that Amy's the lead author on there, and then there's also the icon science cooperative linked in the lower right, which is a cooperative we've launched recently to help people do icon science. So a lot of resources there to learn more. So that's ICON. What is MODEX? So if you're if you're a DOE researcher, you probably already know MODEX. It's a DOE language. Um, but really the, the idea is simple but powerful. And really it's about it being again intentional and purposeful about linking models and data. Um, it doesn't have to be from an experiment per se, but observations, data that are being generated in an iterative loop as shown here. So and you don't necessarily have you have to start somewhere, but it is meant to be a you know a continuous loop of going from observations and using those to conceptualize to develop models, and then taking those models to guide data needs. What data are needed to test a, a model generated hypothesis or improve parameterization or include a new structural component? And it's sort of meant to be a forever loop. Um, that, that's going round and round, and I've seen it also presented as sort of a spiral where the, the objectives are changing, you know, through time as you learn more and more. Um, and so that is those two principles, but this is about putting these two heuristics together. Um, icon Modex. Why do that? Well, if you think about it, these two approaches are there, there are two different ways of looking at, at doing science, and if we put them together, you get more than the sum of the parts. So ICON is about doing science in a way that enhances transferability, that's open, that's mutually beneficial. Modex is about coupling data and models in this iterative learning cycle. If we put those together, in our view, we can really enhance in particular the observations part of the modex loop, but really it's enhancing the whole modex loop by making those observations as useful as possible, as interoperable as possible. So the modex loop is not just about a single research team or a single research objective, but it becomes more than that, it becomes more than itself um, by including ICON in the design and, and execution of modex. And that's sort of that's the that's kind of the high level vision of this research effort is, is to bring these things together. And OK, but what is the application? Like what is the science? Those are just high level heuristics. And the science application here is about sediment respiration. So river corridors, riverbed sediments, hyper on sediments, if, if you like. And what we're doing is working through a number of research goals. So and those are listed kind of bulleted out very, uh, very concisely here on the right, where what we've done is we have uh, artificial intelligence based predictions of sediment respiration across the contiguous US. That's a map shown there on the left. That's from um, 
Stefan Gary. He's on the call, one of our, the Parallel Works collaborators on this effort. So the data from that came from a previous icon based research effort. Those data were put into an or used to develop AI models. Those models are used to then make predictions. So that's great. Think about Modex. We want to go through this loop. So we have these AI predictions and what we want to do here is use those to guide additional sampling within the contiguous US focused on sediments, uh, riverbed sediments, sediment respiration, so that we can test the model predictions. The predictions shown on the left are at many, many more places than we generated data from. You know, that's a prediction. That's kind of the nature of our prediction. Um, we want to use icon based sampling to do this. And then we want to crank, you know, crank the, the Modex uh, a loop, feed those new data into AI, update the predictions, and collect more data. You can imagine this as a rolling uh, sampling uh, Modex approach. Um, and then ultimately, we want to make that model better and better and better, apply across as diverse as diverse systems as we can in, within the, with, with respect to the river corridor to produce transferable knowledge and ultimately robust predictive models. Um, and so that that's sort of the that, that's the science context of how we're using or we're using icon modex to study. And a key piece of this is leveraging uh, the wonders consortium. And so many of you may be familiar with wonders uh, if you're not. Wonders is an icon based uh, global consortium and that is we use icon principles to um, drive sampling campaigns, uh, water sampling campaigns with the community. Focus on river corridors, hydrology, biogeochemistry, microbiology, it's meant to be a resource for the community and samples uh, as well as in some cases data are generated through through crowdsourcing. And so for this this icon modex effort, we're going to use wonders as a vehicle um, to help implement and actually carry out this work. And to tell you a little bit more about how this worked is is previously, and I've mentioned this before, there was a previous uh, sampling campaign that was a wonders campaign. Many of you, I can see some of you were part of this campaign um, as well as other wonders campaigns. Thank you very much. And so in 2019, um, sediment samples were collected at the sites shown here. They were sent back to PNNL. The lines all go back to where PNNL is in the northwest there. Um, and generated lots of different types of data. Those have been published in various uh, various places and, and, and mechanisms. And one of them was the sediment respiration. And so the yellow box is delineating uh, the contiguous US. And those those are the samples. Um, actually, I think those are the only samples that we that we used to generate sediment respiration. The other more globally distributed, you don't have sediment respiration for for some technical reasons. But anyways, we got sediment respiration from all those places using a crowdsourced approach uh, via wonders. And then as I as I said, um, the parallel works folks, Stefan um, and Michael Wild, uh, maybe others, uh, worked those through um, AI models to develop uh, predictions. And so I want to spend some time here. Um, there's a lot going on in this figure. This is this one is, is from Stefan again. So um, and Stefan can certainly correct me if I get anything wrong, but how this is working is basically combining um, artificial intelligence with wonders data as well as uh, glow rich data. That's a, an open database uh, of with uh, environmental data. And um, taking those data, putting them in, combining them with a variety of AI approaches um, to try to develop a predictive model. And so there's training and test sets. And so let's let's kind of walk through the, the figure kind of step by step here. So horizontal axis, this is the observed oxygen consumption from the sediments that were collected by the Wonders Consortium. So we're using oxygen consumption as a proxy for respiration rate. And very briefly, just for context, what that means is sediments come in, we sieve them down to the less than two millimeter fraction, they go into a vial, we add water, and we measure oxygen consumption um, over, in this case, it was six hours using um, an optical method. And so we have this observed O2 consumption, as I said, a proxy for respiration. And so the 
the rate of consumption or the or respiration rate is increasing as you go to the left. So there's, these are represented as, as negative numbers. Um, so the, uh, the amount of oxygen consumed per liter per hour. So higher rates to the left. And then we have the predicted O2 consumption. That's on the vertical. This is the output um, of, the, of, the, of the AI modeling. So um, same idea, same quantitative values. You can see the black line is the one to one line of observed to, to predicted. And so to do that, um, there is, of course, a training set and a test set. And so the training set, those are the solid black, large solid black circles you can see there. And then you have the test set, and those are the open um, larger black circles. And then you have the models. You have the test model, that's the solid red line, and the training model, that is uh, the dashed red line. And then the lots of the little colored circles um, throughout there, uh, those are um, the outcomes of many different kinds of AI methods. Uh, so this is not just a single AI model or single AI approach. There's many different approaches that are being used. Again, not by me, <laughs> by Stefan. Um, and one thing that's really important that you probably already noticed, and it's noted there on the slide, is that the model does 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 pretty well in some parts of the respiration continuum, but other parts it's highly uncertain. It's pretty biased, and in particular, at the low rates, so in the upper right corner, that's where the model's doing the best. And as you move to the left, uh, that is higher rates, the model becomes increasingly uncertain, increasingly biased. Um, you can see the points falling well above the one to one line, and so. OK, the model is a model. It's not perfect. And this is the point of doing Modex, right? We have a model and it's made predictions. We want to make that model better. We want to learn. We want to understand why is that driving off that line? And can we bring things um, closer to the one to one with improved with an improved model with additional data? Um, so I want to before we move on that from that. We're going to go through some more stuff. You have the slide. You can see what we're doing. Um, any burning questions at the moment? Raise your hand or type something. OK. 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 So now you think about how do we use this to actually go get more data, more samples? And the idea is to focus, to use the model bias, the model uncertainty to guide us to where to go. Um, we don't we don't want to go just randomly, right? We can there are parts of the model that are working well and parts that are not. So we have a map here on the left. Those are the, that's the predicted rates. I showed you that map before um, higher rates towards the blue color. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but higher rates to the blue. And then on the right is model uncertainty, and um, these are both made by Stefan again, um, and just bend into lower uncertainty and higher uncertainty, which, as you saw from the last slide, is basically tied to the rates. You know, high rates, high uncertainty, low rates, low uncertainty. And so the map on the right, our current thought, and we will have time to get a lot of feedback from you all on this, but the current idea is to use that map on the right to say, OK, we actually want to go and target the sites that are in red. The sites that are in black, you know, not that, not that they're not unimportant, they are important, but that's where the model's doing pretty well. And so let's focus our sampling where the model's doing poorly. That is the red dots. And so that's a, that's a concept of this initial design of, of this approach. And again, we'll get feedback on that. And so this is really, and I've sort of been saying these things already, but just to, to hopefully clarify if there's any uncertainty here, what we're doing is we're trying to implement icon modex in the context of sediment respiration, right? So we had this initial wonders data. We started with observations, and those initial wonders data from that 2019 campaign, those were not model guided. Those were samples of opportunity. You know, uh, had collaborators come and, and say, OK, we're interested in getting some samples of this flavor. Do you have a field site that could work? Yes. OK, cool. Here's a sampling kit. Um, you know, please, you know, people take samples, they send them back. Great. Generate the data. None of that was model guided. 
we have set, put that generated the, in the, the initial data. So that's where we're here. Wonders to the data to parallel works. Um, AI model predictions. You want to guide sampling and this, this public databases. That's the glow rich uh, coming in. And that, that's what we're doing here, right? Another thing I want to mention, we're not going to dig into this today, but another and this is important for also like why are we doing this? What is the benefit of doing this? What's the outcome? As I said, you know, predictive model learning, uh, those sorts of things. And tied to that <coughs> is this lower this uh, lower right box where the idea is that um, as we crank through this and we get hopefully an increasingly predictive model with reduced uncertainties, we can then take that model and start to incorporate it as a component of mechanistic models in which we are simulating and trying to predict integrated hydrobiogeochemistry of watersheds and basins with a mostly a focus on the river corridor, but still we're also representing some hill slope processes. Um, so if you think about what does the model do? Well, uh, the, the AI model, the AI model predicts variation in sediment respiration off of observables of things that you know that are broadly distributed we can get data products for so if we have that we can use that to then drive mechanistic models or at least inform mechanistic models and that's part of our our science focus area project um, also that's also tied to this this effort uh, also funded by doe and so Xingyan chen is leading that part of it um, that will be the first instance of that as we go will be in the yakima river basin which is in the northwest part of the u.s um, applying that at, at the basin scale. So that's another key kind of outcome that we're driving towards. But again, we're not going to drive into the, the details of that at the moment or not today. And so where are we? We're, we're right here we're, we've got. We've got the model. We want to figure out how to best guide sampling to get new data to drive to inform um, additional instances of the model. And this is what we want to get your feedback on. How do we do this in the best way, the most robust way? And in a way that is beneficial to those beyond our immediate research team. And to say that in a little bit different way, right? We have our science drivers, sediment respiration, spatial variation and sediment respiration. We have a preliminary idea of how we want to do this. That's what we've been talking about. Or here, number three, community feedback. And just to let you know how this will proceed past this point is getting your feedback. And from there, we will design the sampling kits will we'll develop the, the standardized protocols. We'll build kits. Those will get shipped out to collaborators, folks that want to take samples and if people want to take samples. We would very much love uh, to talk to you about that. Community sampling happens. Samples come back uh, to PNNL to generate data. Potentially with analyses, uh, molecular analyses, we will talk about that. The data. Uh, then become publicly available and we will um, ideally crowdsource analyses and as well as writing to again do as best as we can to be open throughout the whole research life cycle and we're just kind of at the beginning uh, uh, stages at the moment. Now doing pretty good on time, so your feedback I mentioned this multiple times. Um, I'm going to go to one more slide after this. So how this is going to work is if you want if you want to say something, ask something very much welcome that. If you can, there's a lot of people on the call. Uh, please use the raise hand function. Um, I think Amy will be able to then unmute you or maybe you can unmute yourself at that point once you're called on. Um, you can we can have a, a follow up meeting a one on one as I mentioned before. Use this feedback form. If you want to get a one on one meeting, um, there's a question in this Google form. Uh, that can uh, point you towards that. As I said, we'll post on the YouTube um, uh, Wonders YouTube channel. You can email us directly, wonders at pnl.gov. That's a Google Doc for any unstructured thoughts. You can be anonymous there. You can put your name. Either is good. And then we're also going to do some polls. So this is the link. And Amy, can you put that link in the chat, please? Uh, and I'll show you how those polls are going to work um, in a moment. Uh, OK, so we have a question. Let's let's. Um, it's a good question. So. In short, but so the question is, how do you ensure that samples are protected against reaction? So 
the reality is is we can't really so the sit the sediments are shallow so like one to three centimeters depth um, and it's realistically we cannot protect them from reaction uh, on the way to to the lab um, they get collected they get scooped they go into a jar um, and they get shipped uh, they're not frozen they just get shipped overnight fedex they arrive uh, we sieve them to get to less than two millimeters so all of that's happening aerobically we add water in um, oxygenated water to the react to the, the vial um, mix shake measure oxygen consumption so i'm not going to say that that's perfect um, but it is we are focused here on aerobic respiration and given that um, you know, shallow sediments, certainly some sh many shallow, shallow sediments will be anaerobic if you have very fine material. Others will be well oxygenated, certainly depends on the hydrologic flux. Um, but at the moment, that is the approach. If people would like to provide feedback or different ideas of how that can be done, um, would love to hear that feedback. And that can come openly right now if you want to jump in and, and discuss. You can write your feedback, as I mentioned, in various forms. Um, so that that's at the moment. That's where we're at. But as I said, happy to hear feedback. OK. So. How can we maximize mutual benefit? These are the the these these four or I guess three sort of flavors of questions. And we're going to go through some polls to dig into these. How do we best choose where and when to collect samples? And that's one thing I guess I didn't say as I'm as I'm realizing that. In terms of the when, when in time do we collect these? The idea at the moment is that we will do this on a rolling basis. So the, the initial set of samples were collected in the late summer, early fall period in the northern hemisphere. Um, so that is kind of August and September. Fairly short period of time, not on a you know not on a single week, but in a fairly short period of time. But in this effort, we need and we want to be able to crank through this modex cycle multiple times. Well, to do that, you have to have samples coming in repeatedly. And ideally, hopefully, the model um, does not depend so much on when samples are collected, because respiration rates are measured under a standard set of conditions. It's a lab incubation, standard temperature, um, adding in, uh, yeah, things are just standardized, uh, kind of a common garden sort of uh, type of experiment or, or measurement. So the current plan is to sample, starting to sample in like late March, or no, I think early April, um, sending out a handful of kits, getting those back, um, generating the data immediately, feeding into the model, making new predictions, getting more, setting out more kits in a in a rolling way. That's the current idea, but again, interested in feedback on that. So where, when do we collect samples? How do we make those choices? How do we find collaborators to help with sampling? So if you're like, if you're involved in previous wonders work, what we did there, as I mentioned before, kind of samples of opportunity. This is very different where we need to target very specific locations where um, as an example, we have high model uncertainty. That's a very different situation, and we need to find specific people in specific places. Would very much like your feedback on how we go about doing that. And lastly, what should be measured? And I want to emphasize that I think we can all appreciate there are huge trade offs in the number of things you measure versus the number of places you go to get data. So the ones in black here, this is this is like the base, the very minimum that, that that we have to do to make this work. The sediment respiration, right? Like we have to have that. Uh, field metadata, we have to have that. I didn't go through what the wonders field metadata is. It's a variety of simple things, observables, vegetation, the general morphology of the system, things like that. Um, just real quick stuff you can you can get from the field. Obviously geo referenced as well. The things in blue are ideas things that we often measure with with wonders and other research efforts and other people do as well, of course. But everything takes time and money um, and there's that trade off more places or more kind more types of data. 
So these are just ideas. Organic chemistry through various mass spec or maybe NMR, ions, microbial communities, surface water, right? We're focused on sediments. Do we need the surface water? Is that vital? Um, so we provide subsamples to people. In previous efforts, uh, Wonders has provided subsamples sub to people beyond PNNL because they were excited. They wanted to help generate some particular data types, and we've done that. You know, we could consider doing that uh, this time around as well. So now, um, unless there are additional questions, I'm going to transition to um, a platform, Poll Everywhere. And thanks, Stefan, for getting us going on this platform. It's quite cool. And I think, does everyone have the link? So just to make sure the link, like what I mean by the link is that one I just put in the chat. I think you already have it, but just to make sure. And then you should see when you open it, I think there's an option to put your name in. You don't have to. Um, the responses should be set up to be anonymous in this platform. In the Google form, you can choose to put your name and email address if you'd like. You don't again, you don't have to. And so you should see a screen like what I'm seeing here. And then if I do this. I'm going to start with this question here. And then I'll, I'll show you how this works. So now I just hit activate, so you should see this screen. If people aren't seeing this, the same screen, let me know. I can see Stefan, do you see it? I can see your video, so yeah, okay, cool. Okay, now how this, how this works, if you haven't used this platform before, is there's two things going on. One is uh, hitting the up, the little, if you like this option, you can hit the up, you know, uh, the thumbs up. If you don't like it, hit the thumbs down. And you can vote on each of these. Um, and then, oh, someone's already done it. Load one more response. So you can put an additional, like some other idea. You don't have to do this. Make sure you vote on the things that are already there. But if you like, oh, there's a different way to do this. Um, you can put your idea in this box, hit submit, and it will show up, and then people can vote on it. So here's what we've got. Um, Oh, those are been repeated, so that's OK. We're learning. Um, if, if you like these ideas, few things at a lot of places, then just vote on those. You don't have you're not putting your response in this box if it's the same as down here. You're just doing thumbs up, thumbs down. If you have a different idea, like it like a very some other way to do this, write that in the response box, hit submit, and then people can vote on that. Um, Little, maybe a little confusing if it's the first time around. So OK, getting some some uh, additional things. OK. Nice. And you can change um, you can change this so you can have the newest ones at the top. Um, and you can also then sort by the things if you hit the top button, it will sort them by which one has the most upvotes. Link didn't work in Chrome, but worked in Firefox. OK. Thank you. All right, so are people good then? Are they are they you have the link? It's working. I guess if anyone has problems, just say so in the chat. OK, so I think. I think we've stabilized. So few things at lots of places. That seems like the current winner. Start with a few things at lots of places, transition to lots of things in a few places. OK, interesting. Um, we have a number of questions that we're going to go through, so we can't hang out too long on, on any one of them. Um, but do people have things they want to say? If you want to verbalize their thoughts on like why they chose this or that, or you know, if they have a strong feeling about something, feel free to just unmute and share. I'll just I'll be quiet for like five seconds, and if no one speaks up, then we'll move on. Yeah, yeah. Eric Rudin from Wisconsin here. Uh, my my thought was start with a fairly restricted number of sites where you measure a lot of things. Figure out 
what seems to be predictive at those sites and then take that information and go to a bunch more sites in the hope that you know you've kind of decided on something that can actually give you traction on on predicting at a larger scale uh it's a pretty straightforward idea but i just thought i'd verbalize that cool thank you very much let's see and I'm seeing a hand up. I can't see who it's from. Sorry. Whoever it's from, you can go for it. Yeah, I think that's my hand. Ah, great. Hi. Hey, James. Um, yeah, I agree with Eric. I think it's better to uh, focus on a few sites and understand them really well and make use of um, ancillary information available for those sites uh, because there, there are quite a number of uh, potentially useful samples that already have a treasure trove of data associated with them uh, that that you could potentially utilize in this effort. Uh, so I'm, I'm just offering my help. That's all I want to say. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, um, can, yep. can you guys hear me, Ricardo? Yep. Yep, please. Okay, so I I, I have like a, an opposed type of view on this. I think that um, just sampling at a few sites is kind of like what we're doing through LTERs and CZOs. I think um, if something new was going to explore um, uncharted territories, it has to start with something that is, you know, go sample at a lot of different places, even if you uh, don't sample everything at those places because I think there is uh, a lack of understanding of how things change, for example, with the attitudes, uh, seasonalities, and you know that that could be better for for the community. Okay, thank you. Not surprisingly, different opinions. There's always you know different approaches to do these things. Appreciate the the feedback. I think a new Walter, I think it was Walter Dodds that just popped up. And yeah, I, I guess I'll take I'll take a similar viewpoint. Um, I think that sampling without having objectives and questions, given the fact that we do know a number of factors that could potentially most likely affect respiration, would be important if we took the the, the approach of sampling a few things at a lot of sites. Um, some of it makes me a little bit uncomfortable to say, oh, let's just sample some stuff and then let the AI, AI tell us what's happening. Um, it makes it really difficult to, to do, um, make an efficient uh, sampling scheme, one. Um, and, and two, uh, it makes it difficult to sell it, why, why people are doing things, you know, if you don't have a hypothesis that, as to why why respiration might be higher at one place or another, how do they choose sites, and if they choose more than one site in their region, what's the, what's the, um, what's, what's the rationale for that, right? What guides them? Because if I remember from the last one, there's a lot of questions, uh, the one with the um, wetting soil, there were a lot of questions that revolved around, you know, where do we sample? What, you know, what's the best place? And, and um, you probably feel the, <laughs> I mean, you feel a many for me, and so I'm sure you feel the field of a ton of them. So, so I think that might be more efficient. Um, we have a really broadly distributed network of, of researchers, um, and so a sample a, a lot of things in a few places leaves most of those people out. It just makes a lot of work for a few people, and so it doesn't take advantage of the concept of, of this particular approach, uh, crowdsourced approach. Thank you. And I think what I'm hearing there is the AI is going to be there, but we need to maybe complement that with a little bit more hypothesis, science question, flesh that out a little bit more to couple that with maybe the model uncertainty to kind of do both at the same time. Is that a fair takeaway? I know you had many points in there, Walter. Yeah, yeah, that... yeah that's the main one. OK, thank you. OK. Um, I. There's a number of other poll questions. I uh, can't quite tell if hand there's a hand up. I don't know if it's a new hand. Is it a new hand? Sometimes they get no nope. left over. OK, OK, very good. Thank you for that one. So let's see if I do this right. 
I deactivate. Um, oh, that's, that's different. OK, then related to this one is this one here. So now you should have a new poll. Same idea. Um, there's a bunch of preloaded possibilities in here. Please vote on those. Um, or if you think like, well, if you do, if you think you shouldn't do it because it's like too many things, um, you know, do the thumbs down. If there's another data type that's not on here, keep in mind these are really about sediments. So chemistry, organic matter chemistry of sediments, sediments. There's one here, surface water aqueous chemistry um, subsamples. If, you, if there's something else, the field metadata, as I mentioned, there's, that's not detailed out. Um, the field metadata is fairly comprehensive. Uh, but put another idea in there if you'd like. Looks like we have mineralogy. OK. I'll just hang tight here until we kind of stabilize. Particle size just showed up. Do it this way. Okay, sediment grain size. Okay. James, are we supposed to just type in other possible things in the box there? In the box, yeah. If you think there's another data type that's not already on the list, that's like, ah, oh, that would be super valuable, then yes, please type it in the box. You hit submit, and then it shows up. So if you're seeing my screen, um, so like this one just showed up, simple hydraulic characterization of the stream, depth, slope. Does that help, Eric? Does... um. For major ion concentrations, this is Laura at Heidelberg University in Ohio. Um, does that mean like pore water chemistry ion con concentrations because you have surface water separate? Yes, right. Okay. We have a hand up. Oh, excellent. Keep, keep going while we discuss. Whoever has their hand up, you can go for it if you'd like. Hey, this is uh, Malcolm Bernard from UNC. Um, I'm actually, I, I would just, I probably should have asked this the last one, but is there a reason why we're not going to where we're not going to be also collecting from uh, the higher certainty areas because my understanding based on how it's described was the certainty is strictly based off of uh, off of the model value. Um, and I, th I think that a little more, it would actually be good to just make sure that we are actually, uh, that they are, of th that the model is well predicting those areas. Super good point. So um, thanks for raising that there. We're going to have a poll question that is right on that about other ideas for how to choose where to go. Um, and so if you could, if you wouldn't mind, um, hold that one. And when we get to that poll question, throw that idea into the res into the response. Um, if that is that work for you? So just got another one, surface water isotopes. I think it seems like we're stabilizing here. 
give you another 15 seconds or so if you want to scan through if there's any you want to vote on again. OK, excellent. Um, does anyone want to say anything about this particular piece? Data types, you know, strong opinions for or against certain things before we move on to the next question. Yep, we have a hand up. Excellent. Look, I think it's Bayani. Yeah, um, it's me. Hi, everybody. So Hi. I added um, particular organic carbon, but I think there was another option called um, bulk CNN content. It might be the same. But it is something I feel strongly about because it's something that we're constantly struggling with right now. Um, there's just not a lot of data out there in the literature. So this would be, a, I think, a major addition to um, knowledge gap. OK, that's all. Thank you. OK, anything anyone else wants to say about that particular idea or any other pieces here? We have another hand. OK. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to really make the argument um, for assessing the microbiome or microbial biomass, um, just because those organisms do play quite a large role in sediment respiration rates. Uh, yep, absolutely. Yeah, well, this was a interesting one of our, and maybe some of you know this, the 2019 campaign, um, a collaborator in Israel um, their lab uh, generated used flow cytometry to generate at least a proxy of microbial well, cell density um, in the sediments and in the water. That was really cool where it wasn't that wasn't PNNL doing that. That was subsamples that were sent over um, and they provided those data um, quite nice. So one reason I'm saying that is if people are like, oh, I love microbial biomass and I'm super good at it, um, I'm going to say we're that's like not something we do a lot of. Would love to send some samples to people if anyone gets excited. Um, Jessica, I think has is your hand up. I think we got all the hands. Ah, OK, very good. Oh, we just had one more response. Microplastics. Uh, Hot topic for sure. OK, so I am going to close that one. OK. OK, now. Maybe a little careful with our time here. So this one is now about sample timing. So as I was mentioning before, um, the current plan is rolling basis, multiple iterations. Of course, the other end of the continuum is everything is like a single snapshot. Um, so or maybe there's some other approach that I haven't thought about. Feel free to put that in there if, if you feel that if you see a different way. And as we've been doing, if people have thoughts they want to share on this particular topic, um, raise your hand and we can discuss as people are putting their responses in. We have another response. Interesting. Time series from a single location. OK, yep, season date be included, certainly. Storm sampling, interesting. Yeah, and there may be, you know, there's this kinds of things. I mean, everything is finite resource wise, um, but I can imagine, at least hypothetically, getting time series from, I don't know, a few sites. Um, to understand, you know, temporal variability in a single location, but couple that with 
maybe the rolling sampling at, at many other places. Okay, let's see hands. All right, I think, oh, there's another one. Yeah, that's an interesting one, the flash freezing trade-offs there. Um, if you if you burst a bunch of microbial cells in doing that can be you can you can bias your your uh, your respiration measurement but I totally hear you like it's always trade-offs of do you allow things to happen during shipping you know keep it cold but things still happen quite tricky yeah in terms of the consistently timed the the best we've been able to do so far, or at least the approach we've taken so far, I'll say it that way, is um, samples are shipped the day after they're collected. It's twenty. It's overnight shipping, and then they're measured the day after they arrive. So you're like three days out from the field. Um, tricky things. OK, I'm going to keep us going. I think this is stabilized. Uh, thank you. I'm not seeing hands or anything. Deactivate that one. And then. OK. Um, this one. This is the one for myself, at least. I'm anxious about. Of finding collaborators as 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 I mentioned before. Um, this needs to be targeted, uh, which is a pretty different scenario and. Honestly, a lot more work um, to try to find collaborators in particular places. So interested in thoughts, especially if people have. Uh, well, in addition, if people have additional ideas um, of how to do this. Would love to hear those thoughts. And same thing as we're voting. If people want to say anything, raise hand, other ideas, have strong opinions. Um, please go for it. OK, interesting. Watershed cancels NGOs. Cool, yep. Academic part of courses. Very nice. OK. It's getting rapid votes. OK, high school students. High schools are everywhere. Um, I can certainly help. OK, it seems like we're stabilizing. Does anyone have anything they want to say out loud or strong opinions? If not, I'll give another. 15 seconds or so to vote um, so we can get to the thing. I think it's the last question that we have. We have a hand up. Ah, OK, yes, please. Um, I would add uh, citizen science groups uh, to the watershed councils and NGOs. Mm, um, okay. we, we at least I saw a lot of the a lot of the area in East North Carolina is very uncertain and. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, of local citizen science groups that would be more than happy to get involved. Cool. Appreciate that. Yeah, so if people maybe just in your minds add that uh, to that answer, the watershed councils and NGOs and citizen science groups, if that changes your votes at all. Um, appreciate that. And we have another hand. OK. Uh, maybe that's me. Um, I just want to echo that. Uh, maybe that was Malcolm's statement about citizen science, group, science groups. Uh, just because it would also increase general support for what you're doing. You'd find so many more people in the public to endorse this effort, I think, if they understood and could contribute. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you for that feedback. OK. Very good. It looks like we're stable. Appreciate all the thoughts. And OK. And by the way, I know you're seeing me hit deactivate. Just so you know, this everything is stored. We're going to download the uh, the info. Oops, I need to wrong button.
And then I think this should be the last one. So you have four minutes. Um, OK, yes, and there was a comment earlier about make sure you include some places with low model uncertainty, I think was the idea. So please throw that in this into this if, if you'd like. Um, and we'll do the same thing. Yeah, this, I'm not sure who put in the consider data density and clustering issues. Certainly seems important. You want to say a little bit more? Yeah, I think that was me. Um, it just seems like the uncertainty may be potentially biased by the original data set, and there may be some data density uh, issues that may be impacting the uncertainty. Yeah, very good. As we're going, Stefan, do you want to say a little bit about, you've, you've tried some approaches to try to help with that. Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the reasons there may be clusters in data is it's, they kind of appear almost regionally, is that the I used both uh, like chemical data that was collected at the site, so like temperature, pH, very point measurements, but the machine learning is also using climate scale indices that are co-located to those sites. So that that's a larger scale pattern, and that might cause sort of larger scale clusters to evolve. Very good. OK. Um, oh, one more response coming in. Known issues. Interesting. So tricky, huh? So many things that impact the environment. Another response. Forest versus ag. OK. So land use kinds of considerations, indeed. OK, we're just about out of time, probably 30 seconds. Um, feel free to Keep voting if you like. Um, I want to say thank you again. I think Amy has put the link. Yes, there's the, the Google form email address. Would love to hear more and more. Uh, open to all of it. As I mentioned, we'll likely have another call, um, probably zooming in more nitty gritty on the sampling itself. Um, uh, and I think it'll probably be mid-January. We'll certainly be communicating about that. So um, thank you. Uh, hope to hear from you all. Um, and if you're interested in helping collect samples, go to that form, send us an email. We certainly need your help. So thanks so much. Hope you'll have a great rest of the day or evening if you're in that time zone. Um, and with that, I'm going to sign off. Take care. Thank you.